Corporate Governance Platform, a program from the Institute of Chartered Secretaries and Administrators of Nigeria, ICSA, is now at your doorstep. By the way, what is corporate governance and what are its key pillars? Will there be any conflict of interest if our person combines the roles of our chairman and our chief executive officer in a corporate organization? What can Nigeria do to gain international recognition in the context of the application of corporate governance? These are many more questions that will be answered on Corporate Governance Platform, a program designed to inform and educate our numerous viewers on the adoption of corporate governance best practices by corporate entities. Join the Corporate Governance Platform crew every Thursday at 4.30 p.m. on MITV, your talent station via DSTV 255 and UHF 43. Corporate Governance Platform, your strategy for the adoption of corporate governance best practices by corporate entities. Institute of Chartered Secretaries and Administrators of Nigeria, except the heart of governance professionals. Good evening and welcome to your favorite program, Corporate Governance Platform, coming to you live from MITV here in Lagos. I am your hand command, Tunde Odeyemi. And in today's episode, we shall be taking a look at best practices on board evaluation. And my guest today is the past president and chairman of Council of the Institute of Charter Secretaries and Administrators of Nigeria, Ixon, Dr. Nosike Agokai. Dr. Nosike Agoka is a seasoned corporate manager, boardroom expert, legal practitioner, banker, economist, corporate governance expert, chartered secretary, arbitrator, and a chartered accountant. He has diverse experience in banking, accounting, board practices, leadership, and dynamics, including corporate governance induction and board evaluation, legal administration, human resources, strategy, corporate and public affairs, and taxation, covering over 30 years. He is currently a legal management and co governance consultant and facilitator to several organizations in Nigeria and abroad, including the African Development Bank in Côte d'Ivoire and their offices all over Africa, the Institute of Directors, Chartered Institute of Bankers of Nigeria, the Institute of Charter Secretaries and Administrators of Nigeria, Ixan. Dr. Agokai was the President and Chairman of Council of Ixan between 2005 and 2007. Dr. Agokai, you are welcome to the show. Thank you very much. And thank you for finding time to join us on Corporate Governance Platform. It's my pleasure. Okay, today we are discussing best practices on board evaluation. I'd like to start this conversation by asking what is board evaluation and the purpose of board evaluation? Well, thank you very much. Board evaluation is just as the name, you know, depicts to evaluate the board to be able to determine the effectiveness of the board. Okay. You know, the board is the highest, apart from the general meeting of the members. In terms of leadership, the board is the highest organ, you know, and it has quite a lot to do develop strategy, implement strategy through the management team, develop policies, develop the risk management framework, develop the risk management policy, IT governance policies, code of conduct policy. The board has got quite a lot to do in terms of roles and responsibilities. Okay. If the board does not get it right, in other words, if the board is not effective, the company is not likely to become a sustainable entity. Okay. So it's important to ensure that the board is effective from time to time. And that's the whole essence of board evaluation, to evaluate the board, the practices, the activities, the roles, and whatever they've done to determine as to whether they are still effective or not. Okay, okay. Who, who, who are those to be evaluated? And in what ways in this evaluation, you know, in this, this evaluation carried out? Well, those, well, very good question, you know, well, a typical board evaluation will involve evaluating the board as a whole. Okay. And also evaluating board committees, because a typical board will have board committees. Okay. And board committees are set up with terms of reference and board committee charters. Okay. Which will spell out the responsibilities of those committees. Okay. So there's a scope. 
and the third level is to evaluate each director on the board. Wow. Now, that evaluation that is done in respect of each director is known as peer evaluation. Peer evaluation. It's peer evaluation because it's every director on the board that evaluates his colleagues on the board. Wow. So, in, in a typical peer evaluation process, you also have to evaluate yourself. Wow. You know, in the past, directors were shy or were not actually bold enough to say, okay, I've evaluated myself. But it's part of the practice now that in addition to evaluating your colleagues, you also evaluate yourself. Although it's, it's known as peer evaluation. And this is why many people shy away from evaluating themselves. But it makes a lot of sense to also evaluate yourself. Okay, I'd like us to go into the provisions of the Code of Corporate Governance as relating to board evaluation. And I'd like to quote a section of the code that says, the board should establish a system to undertake a formal and rigorous annual evaluation of its own performance, that of its committees, the chairman and individual directors. This process should be externally facilitated by an independent external consultant at least once in three years. Now, the question is, why do you think the code specifically requires external facilitation every three years? Well, what that section of the code says actually is that companies must undertake board evaluation every year. Okay. But our companies have a choice as to whether they want to use external consultants, evaluators every year. Okay. All right. So a typical company may decide to use external evaluators every year. But the code has given them a choice as to whether they want to use an external evaluator every year or not, but that once in three years, they must use an external evaluator. Okay. And the reason is very simple. I mean, external evaluators bring objectivity and independence okay. to the process of evaluation. You know, when, evaluate, when the board evaluation is done in-house, typically it's done by the company secretary or the company secretary's team. I've, I've also seen situations where an internal audit function is brought to bear on the process of internal evaluation of the board okay. and the directors. But for you to actually get the outcome, the kind of outcome that you desire, that you expect, it's important that external evaluators are brought in to evaluate entities every year. Okay. I mean, the, one of the reasons why some companies choose to do internally is the reason of cost. Okay. But you need to balance it. You know, what do you really want to achieve? You want to achieve an outcome that indicate clearly the standard and the effectiveness of the board. Okay. Now, I, I mean, I'm not trying to run down anybody in-house, but the truth is that there are certain elements within the organization that may not make it very possible for internal evaluators to do an evaluation that would expose some of the gaps that exist, okay. you know, when it comes to determining the effectiveness of the board. And the one major area, one major challenging area, is the area of peer evaluation. When you use in-house persons to undertake board evaluation, you know, these are their bosses, these are directors, and the, because board evaluation also involves, we'll get to that, having personal interviews with the directors. So sometimes you find that you're in front of your boss trying to interview your boss, asking certain questions that your boss may not be very comfortable with. You also may not be very comfortable with asking your boss such questions. So. Uh, it, it, yeah, cost is an issue, but it can always be discussed. But look at the results. Look at the expected outcome. Look at the fact that you are trying to determine the effectiveness of the board. Find out if there are gaps. Close those gaps. And then get the board to move as a performing board. That's what should be looked at. Okay. Irrespective, the code provides that every three years there must be an external facilitator. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Com com companies would have to do that. But I'm saying that it makes a lot of sense because of the kind of results that we expect to see, because of the goals and objectives of board evaluation, to use external evaluators every year. That's what I'm recommending. And I'm saying that for companies that are not doing that every year, that are not employing external consultants every year, it may be a reason of cost. And that they shouldn't just look at the issue of cost. They should balance it. Balance cost against the outcomes. Balance cost against the results that they expect, and the fact that a, body, a typical board evaluation exercise will enable the company to determine how effective the board is, and then plug all the holes that exist. 
Okay, I would like to system. create a scenario here. The chairman and the managing director, yes. they act in dual capacities. Yes. The chairman is the director and he also shares the board. The managing director is the director, he is also the head of the management as the MD. Now, should they be evaluated in the two capacities separately? And why? Well, you know, when, when you conduct a board evaluation, I've talked about peer evaluation. Yeah. So the chairman is also evaluated by his colleagues. The managing director is evaluated by his colleagues. Both of them will also have to evaluate their colleagues. Mm. In fact, the managing director will evaluate the chairman, and the chairman will evaluate the managing director. But that's completely different. I need to bring out a major point about evaluation of the managing director. Because apart from the issue of peer evaluation, the code has clearly specified, and that's also in line with international best practice, that the chairman of the board must assess and evaluate the managing director. Okay. And apart from the fact of peer evaluation, and that evaluation can only be done if certain targets have been set. Okay. All right. So what you find is some boards would conclude that once you have an assessment of the management team, you've evaluated the managing director. No. You need to set targets at the beginning of the year. The board oh. now will need to set targets against which the chairman will have to evaluate the managing director. The managing director will also have to evaluate the executive directors who report to him. Wow. So the managing director must be evaluated. He has quite a lot to do in ensuring that the board is very effective. Don't forget that a lot of what the board has responsibility for will be delegated to the executive management headed by the managing director. So you need to evaluate the managing director's performance to determine that he's also effective to be able to support the board for the board to deliver, you know, on the mandate that has been given to the board. Again, the chairman has got quite, and this is why I say that, you know, the chairman should not necessarily be the longest serving director. Okay. All right. You need someone who has got the skills to run a board. Who has got the skills to run the dynamics on the board? Because board dynamics is critical to the success of, of board proceedings and whatever the board desires to do. All right. So the chairman, because he has a lot to do, he should also be evaluated to determine the fact that the chairman is still effective and can continue to lead the board effectively. Thank you very much. We'll go for a very short break. When we come back, we continue our discussion on best practices on board evaluation. Please don't go away. Corporate Governance Platform, a program from the Institute of Chartered Secretaries and Administrators of Nigeria, ICSA, is now at your doorstep. By the way, what is Corporate Governance and what are its key pillars? Will there be any conflict of interest if a person combines the roles of a chairman and a chief executive officer in a corporate organization? What can Nigeria do to gain international recognition in the context of the application of corporate governance? These are many more questions will be answered on Corporate Governance Platform, a program designed to inform and educate our numerous viewers on the adoption of corporate governance best practices by corporate entities. Join the Corporate Governance Platform Cool every Thursday at 4.30 p.m. on MITV, your talent station via DSTV 255 and UHF 43. Corporate Governance Platform, your strategy for the adoption of corporate governance best practices by corporate entities. Institute of Chartered Secretaries and Administrators of Nigeria, Ixen, the heart of governance professionals. You are welcome back. It's the Corporate Governance Platform coming to you from MITV. And we are discussing best practices on board evaluation. I see you with me here in the studio, Dr. Nosike Agokai, leading the conversation on best practices on board evaluation. Before we went on break, we were discussing the chairman and the managing, the managing director. director's evaluation. I'd like to extend it further to the shareholders. Now, should the external stakeholders, such as the key shareholders and um, you know, shareholders association, not be involved in the evaluation of the chairman since he presides at the annual general meeting? If yes, how should this aspect of evaluation be better handled? Is it face-to-face -face or through questionnaire? Well, well, you know, we need to understand what we mean by board evaluation. Okay. 
So, and you need to have the skills and the knowledge to conduct board evaluation. So you don't just bring in shareholders to say, come and evaluate. How, what are they going to evaluate the chairman about? They don't understand. The precise some of them, the yeah, precise some, the some of the shareholders may not understand what we even mean by board evaluation. Some of them may not understand the process. Some of them may not understand the methodology. There's a methodology that you have to adopt in evaluating the board and evaluating the chairman, the managing director, and other directors through p the peer evaluation process. But the code has done well by stating the fact that the results of board evaluation should be disclosed. Okay. So shareholders have got the opportunity to see the results of board evaluation. All right? And the results of the board evaluation is also supposed to be used in, uh, it, it forms the basis of a decision making process as to whether this director has done well or has not done well as to whether he should continue to be in office or not. So shareholders typically are not involved in board evaluation. Okay. But they have the opportunity of seeing the results of board evaluation. Now, these results of board evaluation, because there, there are three major aspects, as I mentioned at the beginning. The full board evaluation, the board committee evaluation, and the peer evaluation. Okay. The peer evaluation normally is done in confidence. There's a lot of confidentiality. And this is why after conducting the peer evaluation, it is the chairman that will sit with each of the directors to discuss the results of the evaluation of that director. You know, it's usually not made known, made known to the other directors, except if the board as a whole agree that the results of peer evaluation should be thrown open to all members of the board for them to discuss. Okay. But the practice is that it's, it's confidential, it's the chairman that should discuss the results of that evaluation with that director. But, but the point that I would make here is I usually advise that a consultant who conducted the board evaluation should be present in a meeting where the chairman is discussing the results of the evaluation of a typical director. Okay. Because the chairman may not be able to distill the points that have been made about certain aspects of deficiencies when it comes to the issue of how the director has performed. So the evaluator will be able to throw more light and respond to questions. Because the director that was evaluated, who is being spoken to by the chairman at that time, may be asking some questions. Wow. And so you need the evaluator to be around to respond and assist the chairman in uh, dealing with some of those questions. Okay, still talking about the peer evaluation. How can you encourage directors during evaluation to give objective assessments of their fellow directors in order to identify improvement areas considering our culture of trying not to hurt the feelings of others while giving the feedback no i mean what you need to do, and that's why i keep talking about using external evaluators who have the knowledge and the experience and the skills okay you need to motivate and encourage that director in a way that will lead the director to divulge information okay if the director believes that the discussion would creep into the public space. He's not likely to talk to you faithfully. Wow. You know, so you need to encourage that director and, and, and get the director to understand that this is an exercise that would lead to improvements. This is an exercise that will add value. Okay. And that whatever is discussed will be in strict confidence. All right. So you need to say all this to encourage that director to speak out. You know, just like if you are in a parliament or national assembly, and you ask people to vote in camera, okay. you know, you're likely to get the best result. But if you ask them to vote openly, openly. some of them may vote ac in, according to party lines. Okay. You know, it may be against their conscience, but they are voting because they do not want the party to discipline them. The party discipline. You know, so, so just take it into the body evaluation process. You tell the director that what we're going to discuss will be treated in confidence okay. and that no director will know what has been discussed, except the fact that the director who is being evaluated will see the results. And when he sees the results, he does not know who has said this. He does not know who of the director, his colleagues, said that he does not attend meetings. Okay. He does not know who amongst his colleagues that said he does not prepare well wow. before coming to the meeting. He just sees that someone said this director does not prepare well. He does not contribute to discussions at meetings. He doesn't know who has said it. So confidence is the major element that will encourage 
I mean, confidentiality is a major element that will encourage directors to talk. Okay, I would like to go back to the code of corporate governance. You know, the code provides that the performance of a director is considered to be unsatisfactory. The board should provide appropriate training to address the identified gaps. Now, how appropriate is it for the board to be able to identify the training needs of such director? Is it not better for the chairman to engage the director directly rather than do it on peer evaluation rather than have the whole director have a judgmental value on the whole uh, evaluation no, 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 no. That, that's not you see that's not what the code actually says the code when the code says the board yeah it does not mean that all members of the board will sit and say these are the training needs of this guy okay you know the the board evaluator will pick it from because there has to be a plan of action if you conduct a body evaluation you need to present recommended plan of action to the company okay. it's recommended because ultimately it's the company that will determine their plan of action but you need to assist that board and the company to develop a plan of action so in that plan of action based on the results and the outcomes of the evaluation the evaluator who is knowledgeable who is skilled who knows how to determine training needs would have seen from the results that this director needs this, this director needs this, this director needs this. So he puts it in the report, all right? And in the process of having one-on-one -on -one interview with the directors, the directors will also reveal some of the training needs. In fact, let me say this. Some directors will even tell you, I think I need training in this area, mm. all right? And if you stretch it, you will find that that director is very honest about that. So there, there are many ways of determining the training needs. It's not for the board to just see it and say, this director needs this training. But you recommend the training areas. And then the chairman, the board, the company secretary, the head of training or head of human resources will then look at an aggregate all and then build a training program. And you see, some training programs that come out of body evaluations are not successful because they are not discussed with the director concerned. Wow. You need to discuss it with the director concerned, all right? Otherwise, you throw up and plan a training program, and you simply say to the director, we have arranged this training, this training for you. He says, no, I'm not interested. I don't need it. So you need to discuss it and then get the director to agree that he needs training in this area. Sometimes they resist, but you need to explain and explain why. I did a board evaluation. One of the directors said, I don't need that training. Hmm. All right, but when we developed, we had to assist the company to develop the content. And he saw the synopsis and he said, Oh, I would like to participate. Okay. Because the fact that you've determined training needs for a particular director does not mean that that is the only director that will attend that training. Other directors whose you know, evaluations have not revealed that kind of training needs may also derive benefit from that training. So it's, it's quite a lot of things. Okay, like talking it. about training. What should the company consider before incurring the associated training cost? No value. What kind of value are we going to derive from this training? The board, ev board evaluation, the major objective is to determine the effectiveness of the board and then follow up to ensure that the standard, the effectiveness of the board is improved upon. You know, so are we going to conduct this training because we have identified training needs? Are we conducting this training because we want to ramp up the effectiveness of the board? If the answer is yes, okay. then we'll then look at the cost. Because the value of an improved effectiveness of the board should be the major consideration, not simply cost. Okay. Now, still talking about training. You know, we, we talked about training as, the, as a result from the evaluation. Now, should training for directors be dependent on the evaluation results? Should it not be mandatory for directors to attend some mandatory trainings annually? For example, corporate governance training and those relevant to the business of the company. Well, that, that's, that's a very good question. You see, you develop training needs from the board evaluation, okay. all right? But the corporate governance code also provides that there should be a training, a policy on training for directors. So apart from, there are different kinds of training for directors. I'll just mention them quickly. Okay. One is, Board induction, once they are appointed, you do a board induction to train them to understand the business, 
and understand the company and the processes of the board. There are quite a lot of things involved here. The second one is annual training. Okay. Where there are new practices and you discover new ways of doing business. So you say our directors, there are new ways of doing business. You need to undergo this training. The other one is the one we've just talked about. Determining the training needs from the board evaluation. So it's not only training that, co that comes up as a result of board evaluation that you conduct for directors. Training can come up. For instance, insurance companies had training for insurance directors. Sure. And all directors of insurance companies were asked to attend. So it's not only when you determine needs from board evaluation that you organize training for directors. No. There are many reasons why. So companies conduct trainings for directors like two, three times a year. Wow. So training for directors is sacrosanct apart from the board evaluation. This is where we will wrap up today on our discussion on best practices on board evaluation. Dr. Nosike Agoke, past president and chairman of Council of Ixan. Thank you very much for coming on the show. Thank you very much. It's my pleasure. Once I'm again. sure when we invite you another time, you will oblige us. I will be pleased to be here. Thank you very much, viewers, for staying with us on the show. We'll wrap it off on this note. Please join us again next week, same station, same time. I remain Tunde or Deemi. Bye for now. Corporate Governance Platform, a program from the Institute of Chartered Secretaries and Administrators of Nigeria, ICSA, is now at your doorstep. By the way, what is corporate governance and what are its key pillars? Would there be any conflict of interest if our person combines the roles of our chairman and our chief executive officer in the corporate organization? What can Nigeria do to gain international recognition in the context of the application of corporate governance? These are many more questions that will be answered on Corporate Governance Platform, a program designed to inform and educate our numerous viewers on the adoption of corporate governance best practices by corporate entities. Join the Corporate Governance Platform crew every Thursday at 4.30 p.m. on MITV, your talent station via DSTV 255 and UHF 43. Corporate Governance Platform, your strategy for the...